You've committed a murder and you've confessed to it. I didn't do it, darling. I can tell you he was a pedophile. I'd like to know your definition of a pedophile. And he says, I just want to get it off my chest. Have we got that man? Bloody earth we have. Hello, this is Inside Crime. I'm Leila McKinnon. Unsolved crimes have always captured our imaginations, and our first two stories are no exception. Both have twists that will leave you wondering where the truth lies. Tonight, we look at the story of Arthur Greer, a violent man with sexual abuse convictions who spent 25 years in prison for murdering a 14-year-old schoolgirl. But Greer says he didn't do it. But first, the abduction and murder of three-year-old Cheryl Grimmer from a crowded beach over 50 years ago. Astoundingly, a man claiming to be the killer provided police with a detailed confession, but he's never been prosecuted due to an extraordinary legal technicality. Ferry Meadow Beach, 90 kilometres south of Sydney on Australia's east coast. Without a sound and without a trace, three-year-old Cheryl Grimmer disappears. 50 years on... It was just a terrible day. She was gone. Three brothers still haunted by their sister's disappearance. This cop broke the case. Have we got that man? Bloody earth we have. But then it broke him. That was the time I knew I couldn't be a police officer anymore. The final straw. How can you walk when you've committed a murder and you've confessed to it? The man who confessed to killing Cheryl gets to walk free. If there's a murderer walking the streets, don't we all want him locked up? It's July 2016, and Detective Frank San Vitale has just been handed a 50-year-old cold case. It's a case the local cop knows well, as do most who live in the Australian region of Illawarra, the taking of three-year-old Cheryl Grimmer. This is probably the uh, hardest case I've ever worked on personally, because I've lived in the Illawarra all my life. Uh, it changed my life. It changed, I think, a lot of people in the Illawarra uh, when she went missing. I think there's a bit of an innocence lost. Uh, it's always stuck in your head, where, where did this little girl go? Uh, what happened to her? Frank poured through boxes of police archives, going back in time to the summer of 1970, when there was no bigger news, no more desperate search than that surrounding the missing toddler. Yeah, it was a very hot summer's day. I sort of nagged my mum, you know, we're new to the country, we've got a beautiful beach, and um, we wanted to come down the beach as kids. This scratchy photo captures the day Ricky, just seven, along with his brother Stephen, aged five, and Paul, four, are playing on Fairy Meadow Beach with their mum and baby sister Cheryl. It was a beautiful day. It was a really nice day. And, uh, you know, kids being kids, building sandcastles and Cheryl running up and down the waterline as, as we did. We didn't venture in too far because the... Uh, the surf was all new to us coming from Bristol in the UK. But within a few hours, this idyllic outing comes to an end with the onset of a southerly change. Mum, 26-year-old Carol Grimmer, sent the kids ahead while she packed up on the beach. My mother asked me to take Stephen and Paul and Cheryl up to the shower blocks to wash the sand off um, to walk back uh, to, the, to the hostel. Had you done that before? No. On the way to the showers, Cheryl stops for a drink at the bubbler. Having got Cheryl showered in the men's changing room, Ricky was then unable to coax his playful sister out of the nearby ladies' shower block. I said, look, I've got to go and get... Mum, you're going to get into trouble. And she still wouldn't come. She was just laughing, smiling, not a care in the world. My brothers were playing just over here. And um, I just wish every day I would have sent one of them and just stood here. But I didn't. 
walk down to the beach to get my mother. I just wish I'd dragged her. Why didn't you go in and grab her? I was a boy. I didn't, didn't want to go into the girls' shower block. There was other girls in there. I didn't want to go in. They're told not to go in. In a decision he still can't forgive himself for, Ricky leaves Cheryl to fetch his mother, followed by his little brothers. It was all of 90 seconds, but by the time Carol Grimmer got her boys back to the chain shed, there was no sign of Cheryl. Nothing seemed to be wrong until my mum was sort of just shaking me and saying, we would you leave her? And I told her several times over. And then it set in. She was gone. Rick was freaking out, Mum was freaking out. It was just a terrible day. <laughs> a minute and a half was all it took for a family to be forever changed, to suffer a lifetime of grief and guilt. Yes, a nightmare. Yeah. Here we are 50 years later, three, not four. For me, it's like living the day every day of my life. Cheryl's disappearance galvanised the people of the Illawarra to mount one of the biggest searches ever seen in New South Wales. There's just no trace of her at the moment. Even the army got involved, supporting Cheryl's dad, Vince, who was one of their own. Well, if in fact she has been taken away by someone, have you any words for that particular person? Oh, I got some, I got some words. All right, I'll tell you that now. But um, if anybody has got my daughter, I would honestly and truly, I would like her back unharmed, as early and as quick as possible. That's about all I can say. There were leads, multiple reports of a man taking a toddler but no trace of Cheryl was found, and the police investigation went cold. Mum had a hard life after that. It was like, Dad was a really nice man, but it was really hard. And it was sort of like, hey, you four lost my baby daughter. That's what it felt like some days. But mostly, it seemed the broken Vince blamed Ricky. We had a strained relationship from that day on. Unfortunately, you know, if he had a drink too many, the blame would come out. Why did he leave her? Why did he leave? You hear that enough and mm. you start, start to question why did I For decades, the case of Cheryl Grimmer went untouched. Year after year, the tormented family not knowing what happened to their baby girl. But 47 years after she disappeared, Detective Frank San Vitale made a stunning find. Cheryl's fate may have been known all along, her killer right under their noses. When you first read that confession, did any part of you go, well, he could have made this up? No. No. No way in the world. I knew how old the case was. Um, I'm like a dog with a bone. <laughs> And uh, I, when I picked it up, I couldn't let it go. Not long into the new investigation, Frank found himself with a new partner, the equally dogged detective, Damien Loom. I still remember we uh, stood there in front of these boxes and Damo said to me, I, I call him Damo, he said to me, uh, Frank, uh, the murderer's here in these boxes somewhere. I had a bit of a laugh to myself, but OK. For the next couple of months, Frank and his partner would sift through thousands of running sheets, cross-checking leads long gone cold, interviewing and eliminating former suspects. 
And then one day in yet another box, they uncovered a chilling confession made in 1971. Would you like to tell us what you know about the disappearance of this girl? Nearly a year and a half after Cheryl disappeared, a 17-year-old runaway made a startling admission to police. I'd come around the front of the pavilion behind her and grabbed her. Volunteering, he had abducted Cheryl. There was some bloke sitting on the wall in front of the pavilion, so I had to put my hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming. Because if she had of scream, he would have heard it. Uh, how could somebody give that much detail uh, of Ferry Meadow Beach, uh, of Cheryl, of where he took her, what she was wearing? I well, suggest that he was telling the truth. What was your intention? I was going to have sexual intercourse with her. The detail of what he said he eventually did to little Cheryl is deeply disturbing. Did you have sexual intercourse with her? No, because she started to scream as soon as I took the gag of her. What did you do when she started to scream? I put my hands around her throat and told her to shut up. What happened then? I guess I must have strangled her. She stopped breathing, stopped crying, and I thought she was dead. So I panicked and covered her up with bushes and run for it. Frank says retracing the confession gives a clear picture of how Cheryl was taken. We know at the time he was, uh, he'd escaped from a juvenile detention home. We you know he previously lived in the area. We were told what he had done. That's a hard part to talk about. The grief for Cheryl's brothers Ricky, Paul and Steve Grimmer is compounded by anger. They were staggered to learn through Frank that this confession even existed. We were shocked. We looked at each other and said, hang on, this boat's confessed to it and they're telling us now? And this is 47 years later? They're telling us that someone admitted to killing our sister? I couldn't believe it. That's disgusting as far as I'm concerned. It's hard to fathom now, but police at the time made cursory inquiries before filing it to be forgotten for half a century. The police said there wasn't not enough substantial evidence to, uh, to arrest the person. Everything he said in that confession, we found to be true. We did not find one lie. Hey, Phil, how you going, mate? Well, with Frank's help, we've been put in touch with one of the two detectives who took the original confession. Phil Finlay was the junior officer on the day the 17-year-old made his damning admissions. On face value, it certainly fitted the framework that we were looking at. She was so um, fluent answering uh, without any hesitation. It just it all just flowed on mm. from his mouth. How did you strangle her? With my hands. But the officer in charge on the day took a skeptical view of the confession. He judged it didn't warrant further investigation because police couldn't substantiate the details given to describe the place where he said he murdered Cheryl. But even so, to Phil Findlay, the confession was compelling. So, for 47 years, the confession was forgotten. 50 years ago, this was all farmland, about to be turned into a new suburb. But on the 12th of January, 1970... I put my hands around her throat. ..it also became a grave site, according to the man confessing to the murder of Cheryl. She stopped breathing and stopped crying. Do you believe that first confession? Very much so. There's a little girl in that area there, around here. To the original investigators, the suspect said when he brought Cheryl here, he remembered distinct tubular fencing and a cattle grit. Details those officers could not confirm. I took the little girl's swimsuit with me. In his confession, the teenager said after killing Cheryl, he took with him her towel and swimming costume. 
He described where he dumped those items, the towel in a drain outside a service station and the costume in an incinerator at a camping ground. I burnt them in the incinerator on the beach going up towards Carmel. While neither piece could be retrieved, the service station and incinerator were both where he said they were. He talks about the costume, uh, the towel, where he took the towel, uh, where he dumped the towel, where he burnt the costume, Cheryl's costume. And uh, that's the first thing that got me. And I said, well, uh, there's a lot of detail here. How, how does somebody come up with that story? That really stood out for me. But it was this next detail that made the confession ring true to the boys who were there. He saw Cheryl have a drink at the bubbler. Did the little girl come out with the other children? Yes. She had a drink at the water fountain. Someone lifted her up, I think. That someone was Ricky. That was what you call a eureka moment. Just that detail there. He had to be here. He had to be here. And he, he saw what he saw. Surreal. To me, I mean, that it just confirmed he was there watching waiting for his opportunity. If you weren't there, you wouldn't have known that Rick picked Cheryl up to give her a drink at the bubbler. In my eyes, that's 100% yes, he's telling the truth. I killed your sister. This is the man who confessed to murdering three-year-old Cheryl Grimmer in 1970. He would not be quiet. Not be quiet. So I put my arms so around my her arms throat and strangled her. Strangled her. He can't be identified because he was 17 at the time. I covered her up with her up bushes and leaves and threw some dirt on top. Now, in his 60s, he's free to go about his life in suburban Melbourne, protected by anonymity and the certainty that he's now beyond the law. He knows he's guilty. We know he's guilty. The police know he's guilty. If the police would have just done their job, 48 years ago when he walked in and gave such a detailed confession, um, we wouldn't be sitting here today. As the years have gone by for brothers Ricky, Paul and Steve, the outrage has only ever grown. Never did they imagine their fight for justice would be such a cruel road. For the last three years on that road with them, has been former Wollongong detective Frank San Vitali. It's one of those cases that you get in your career where uh, you just can't let go. Uh, we're, we're talking about a three-year-old girl here. We're talking about Cheryl. These three guys are like brothers to me now. Uh, I don't know what they're going through. And sometimes I, sometimes I um, deeply feel I should never have picked up that bloody brief. It was in that brief that Frank found the forgotten confession that seemed to crack open the case that made justice seem so much closer. When you first read that confession, did any part of you go, well, he could have made this up? No. No. No way in the world. There's too much detail. Um, that takes the cake. Uh, every bit of what he said, we found it to be true. Uh, uh, there was nothing in that, th uh, in that story that he gave that we found not to be true. Frank's next step was to find the suspect. That was surprisingly easy. I get a phone call on my mobile phone. There was a very long pause, and then he says to me, is it something, it, it's, it, it's something I did when I was very young, which I regret every day of my life. It's in my statement. Then he says, is it about a young girl at Ferry Beach? He, he didn't use Ferry Manor, he just said Ferry, I remember that. And I said it could be. The man agreed to meet Frank and his partner, Detective Damien Loon, at a police station in Victoria. Though he'd been advised to bring a lawyer, he showed up on his own. The first question we asked is why haven't you got legal representation? And he says, I just want to get it off my chest. I thought then and then he was going to um, confess to us. Frank presented him with the 1971 confession to murder, which he readily admitted he'd made. But when it came to the critical question, 
Did you do it? This time, he had a different answer. We put the confession in front of him. We go through the confession. He actually signs it again, so he adopts it. He says, yeah, that's me, I made that confession. He signs every page, and we go through every one of those questions. Until we got down to what happened with Cheryl, he says, oh, no, I was never there. When he sat there and said, no, I've never been there, and he had 47 or 48 years to come up for an alibi, um, for me, that was, that was a moment I said, yeah, we got our man. Given the detail of the area he'd given at the time, his denial seemed false and pathetically inadequate. And so, after half a century, Frank thought the Cheryl Grimmer case had finally been solved. Do you have anything to say about your arrest? The man was immediately arrested, which didn't seem to come as any great shock to him. We said to him, you've got to be charged with the murder of Cheryl Grimmer and you'll be extradited back to uh, New South Wales. And he basically said, oh, uh, I better tell someone. I know if that was me and I didn't do it, I'll be kicking up a storm. At the time you arrested him, did he ever say, you've got the wrong man? No. This is a big mistake? No. Have we got our man? Bloody oath we have. He's the man. No doubt. For the Grimmer brothers, the news of the murder charge was met with mixed feelings. It forced them to accept Cheryl was never coming home, but also that finally someone was being held accountable for her death and their pain. Finally, we're gonna get some results. We finally got the grub that took our little baby sister. Great. Unbelievable. We're getting somewhere with it. I just, I just feel, feel for mum and that, that um, they didn't get to hear this. They, they need, they need to hear this. They got somebody. All those years and not now. If he walks out of that court a free man, so be it. So be it. We don't believe that will happen. The murder suspect who pleaded not guilty was held on remand at Silverwater Jail. But at a pre-trial hearing, the judge was asked to throw out the confession. His lawyers argued it was inadmissible because the 17-year-old accused did not have a parent, guardian or lawyer present when he volunteered his crimes in 1971. In those days, it was not a legal requirement for a juvenile to have such a protection. That law came in some years later, but the judge in the Grimmer case agreed to apply it retrospectively, finding it would be unfair to the accused to have his confession included as evidence. The judge also said, at the time, police should have cautioned the accused earlier in their interview, making it clearer that he was a suspect not just a witness. But the damning confession was out, and so was the suspect, released from jail, with the case against him now considered unwinnable. The Grimmers were devastated. How can you walk when you've committed a murder and you've confessed to it, but you get away because you didn't have a parent holding your hand when you were questioned by the police? <sighs> How can this happen? I mean, this is... This is not real, surely. Are, are we just, you know, sitting in a play? I mean, this is just stupidity. Um, it can't happen twice, surely. We're not going to let it happen. No, definitely not. We'll be the voice of our parents. Um, enough. The judgment broke Frank. After 21 years with the police force, he walked away from his dream job. There was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing wrong um, with the confession, the way it was taken. I just could not believe it. Uh, that was the time I knew I couldn't be a police officer anymore. I gave, that's when I just can't do it anymore. That was the final straw. Not a three-year-old girl. No, 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 they got to me. We got a uh, murderer walking the streets. 
That's just how I feel. For Ricky and his brothers Steve and Paul Grimmer, this man has got off on the worst type of legal technicality. And former Supreme Court judge Anthony Wheely agrees the judgment is not about the truth of the confession, but how that confession was taken. The judge's task is not to test the validity of that confession, but to test the circumstances of the interview itself and the condition of the young person. According to Anthony, as mad and maddening as the result might seem, the judge on the day was working within the dispassionate confines of the law, which means there are no grounds on which to appeal. I understand that the Attorney General has taken advice and has come to the conclusion, regrettable though it is, that no appeal would, would be likely to succeed. There doesn't appear to be any further avenue. But the law has been upheld, and that's what as citizens, we have to accept. It's like we're on our own. We're on our own fighting the New South Wales justice system. In our eyes, stinks. Now we're here. We're trying to get, a, get him back in court. Get him where he belongs in jail. That's where he belongs. No, I'm not accepting anything. No, no. It's... We made a promise to our mother and we're going to keep it, no matter what it takes what people we hurt, what toes we stand on, we are going to stand on toes until my sister is heard. And we will not stop. The raw anguish this family suffers is hard to witness, so it must be unbearable to live with day after day. I don't deserve happiness. I should have not left her standing there on her own. But we, we all shouldn't have left her. I know you were the oldest, but we're all there. We all shouldn't have left her at all. But being little kids, you don't expect someone to come and pick your little sister up and run off of them. Former detective Frank San Vitale, driven by a desire to bring justice and peace to families like the Grimmers, feels instead he's let them down by not getting his man. How do I feel towards him? <laughs> I run and I say. I think you know how I felt towards him. Frank may have left the force, but that doesn't mean he's given up on Cheryl, and nor, it seems, has she given up on him. I see Cheryl in my dreams. It's a dream, it's not a nightmare. I see her standing on the beach. Just keeps on saying, don't let go, uh, we'll get there. You're about to meet Arthur Greer, a violent man with sexual abuse convictions who spent 25 years in prison for murdering a 14-year-old schoolgirl. But all is not what it seems. The first shameful moments of freedom for convicted child killer Arthur Greer as he's deported to the UK. For 25 years, this man has been behind bars in Western Australia for the murder of schoolgirl Sharon Mason. For all that time, he's proclaimed his innocence, foregoing the chance to be free decades ago if only he admitted his guilt. It's cost me my life. Sacrifice I had to make, you know, to say I was guilty of something I didn't do. Couldn't do that. When it comes to Arthur Greer, Knowing what to believe is confounding. OK, yeah. His own family is bitterly divided, daughter against daughter. One, a victim, claiming she was molested by her father. It was nasty, it was evil, it was horrible. He is 
bad person. The other, their father's greatest supporter. I oh, know my dad didn't do anything. He's innocent. He said, I didn't do it, darling. That's all I needed, if I needed that at all. And in the wider community, Arthur Greer is equally divisive. For some, a monster who is guilty of murder. For others, a man who could not have been more wrongly accused. In my opinion, Arthur Greer's case is the worst miscarriage of justice, if not in Australian legal history, then in West Australian. February 19, 1983. Election day for Western Australia. On this stinking hot summer day, 14-year-old Sharon Mason disappears after getting off a bus in the Perth suburb of Mossman Park. Then, nearly 10 years later, in 1992, Sharon's body was uncovered during excavation work behind a former dress shop. That shop was owned by Arthur Greer at the time Sharon went missing. There's no doubt about it that Mr Greer had a chequered past that included uh, offences of violence. Perth barrister Jonathan Davies says in investigating Arthur Greer, police had an obvious suspect. First, there was the body behind his shop, then his own damning criminal record. By looking at Mr Greer's past, uh, they were incontrovertibly drawn to him as their prime suspect. And it's little wonder when you hear Greer's criminal record, his most serious and heinous crimes, two convictions for two indecent assaults. Susan was just seven when she was abused by her father, to which she pleaded guilty in 1969 and got an 18-month suspended sentence. For the other assault against a teenage girl, he served six months. Susan is brutal about her father. I can tell you he was a pedophile. And that I was interfered with. And it wasn't just a little touch here and there. Every few weeks, maybe every few months. Are you a pedophile? No, I'm not a pedophile. I'd like to know your definition of a pedophile. Somebody who frequently uh, solicits young children. Have you done that? No. Occasionally? Never. No, never. But then, in 1986, Greer was jailed for three counts of attempted murder for trying to run over his former girlfriend and two friends. While the judge said his drunken attack was not premeditated, he still sentenced Greer to a minimum of five years in jail. Greer claims, as he does to explain the sexual abuse convictions, that his intentions were misunderstood. I never hurt anybody. Is my crime, my, my record, would you say it's a really bad record? If you look at the circumstances of it, it's not. It's not. 1992, and Greer was just out of jail when this gruesome discovery was made. A decade after going missing, 14-year-old Sharon Mason's body was uncovered during excavation work. Just one day later, police arrested and charged Arthur Greer with her willful murder. And they did a check of who owned the shops in 1983, and my name come up, and they checked my name, and they found out I'd been in trouble before, and uh, I just couldn't answer the question because I didn't know anything about it. The police case against Greer centred around three main pieces of circumstantial evidence, which certainly looked bad for Greer, but on review started to raise serious doubts. At his trial, the jury was told Sharon had gone to Greer's shop, enticed by a help wanted sign in the window. But no one saw her go in, and police couldn't present a single witness 
who testified even seeing the help wanted sign. Second, Sharon's body was found wrapped in plastic bags and tied with ribbon police said were particular to Greer's dress shop. But it was later revealed that both bags and ribbon were widely available. A single fingerprint was found on the bag, but forensically tested, it was not Arthur Greer's. And then finally, there was this mask, supposedly once owned by Greer and found when Sharon's body was uncovered. We believe that the mask was not actually found buried with the body, but in fact was found near the remains in a large volume of earth that was at that time in the back of the, uh, the dump truck. And so the connection between the mask, Mr Greer and the human remains, is cast into doubt. The jury took just three hours to reach their unanimous verdict. Despite no forensic evidence to link him or no known cause of death, in 1994, at the second of his two trials, Greer was convicted of murder and sentenced to life. He was to serve a minimum seven years before being considered for parole. To Sharon's family and a relieved community, justice had been done. Did you murder Sharon no, Mason? Definitely not. I've never met her. I couldn't have heard her. For the past 25 years, Arthur Paddy Greer had been behind bars for murdering Perth schoolgirl Sharon Mason. And for that time, Chrissy's been the only member of the family to stand up for Arthur, the only one still hoping to bring him home. Why do you think your father was convicted of this? I believe quite strongly that it was because of his criminal history. But that's where it started and it never stopped from there. Former Governor of Western Australia, QC Malcolm McCusker, has become an unlikely Greer advocate warning no matter how bad the record, no matter how bad the man, no one should be judged on their past. Well, I hope there are very few people in our community, and I, I may be naive, but I think there would be very few people who'd take that attitude that a person who's con been convicted of a crime therefore must be guilty of another one. It was a huge and illogical step. And they searched Greer's shop, and there was not the slightest trace of anything, no blood, no anything like that. So there was absolutely no evidence whatever that connected him with this crime. In fact, according to McCusker, since Greer's conviction, compelling fresh evidence has been uncovered that suggests a miscarriage of justice. What we had to look at when we did our survey was the, the three different versions of where the body was found. Mm. The Innocence Project at Perth's Edith Cowan University, now led by Professor Jane Tudor Owen, carefully assessed the merits of the Greer case before agreeing to take it on. They say what they've found over the past decade raises reasonable doubt in Arthur Greer's guilt. Enough, they believe, for a jury to acquit him. We think that there's an alternative story. We think there's an alternative version of events that um, should have been presented to the jury at the time, um, and that ideally, by, by raising this information now, um, that can be considered um, in, a, in a fresh light. So we're looking at that as the corner of the wall. What so you're about to see is what the jury didn't get to see. To Got the pipes um, quite clearly displayed there. In the first to the and perhaps the greatest system. breakthrough for the Innocence Project, um, the remarkable discovery of a date stamp on drainage pipes beneath where Sharon's body was found. They'd been manufactured and laid in the ground just weeks before her body was uncovered in 1992. Digging the trench, they would have had to have found the body um, to install those pipes in 1992. But remember, Greer supposedly murdered and buried Sharon here in 1983, nearly a decade earlier. If that was the case, she would have been found underneath the pipes, not above them as she was. In simple terms, her body had to have been buried here not long before it was found. Was that a eureka moment? Yeah, I would, I would say in terms of um, being able to actually have some definitive evidence was really exciting. Well, if it had been revealed at either of his trials, I think that would have been the end of the case against him. 
because they were new pipes. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the body was deposited on top of those pipes. The crux of the police case was that Sharon was murdered in Arthur Greer's shop and buried by him in the backyard. But the dating of the pipes is almost proof positive that couldn't have happened. And the state of Sharon's body is perplexing too. It was only partially decomposed, extraordinary after nine years. A former senior state pathologist says the only feasible explanation for that strange rate of decomposition is that the body must have been stored elsewhere, perhaps frozen, before finally being buried at the shop site at the time the pipes were laid. However she came to die, that did not take place at those shops. And when she was not reburied in the rear of the shops until the person responsible saw that there was earthworks there and that there would be an opportunity of permanently concealing a clandestine grave. And all of these points, we believe that the jury that convicted him would have found differently had they been aware of the facts that have emerged as a result of the work of the Innocence Project. We can hear you Over the saying... last 25 years, Arthur has been in front of the parole board six times denied release each time because he wouldn't admit to murdering Sharon Mason. Did, you get, did the parole ball approve your parole? <laughs> For Chrissy and their friend Val, the relief is obvious. No longer deemed a threat and in ill health, the 80-year-old is to be a free man. <laughs> OK, Dad, love you. Bye. He's crying. Oh, please. <laughs> A British citizen, as a condition of his release, Greer is deported to the UK immediately. In London, after fighting for so long to clear his name, his freedom, without exoneration, is somehow incomplete. I'll always be guilty in some people's eyes, I know that. But the point is, there's a lot of people out there who have faith in me and listen to what I've said, and I'm innocent of any of that charge. If I had have done that, I would have said it was guilty a long, long time ago. Arthur Greer died in exile in February 2019 of cancer, nine months after he was released from jail.